and um, recording. And oh, the recording started. And uh, at this point in time, I'd like to pass it over to, to him and I'll be quiet. Corey, over to you. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Steve and uh, Mark for your assistance as well too. Um, I'm gonna be uh, keeping an eye on chat. Uh, so feel free to uh, post any questions or comments, whatnot uh, throughout the presentation. Um, I'll uh, rely on uh, Mark or Steve, uh, anyone else on that committee to let me know if there's any specific issues uh, with the video or not able to hear me, uh, or if there's any specific uh, messages in chat that uh, I'll need to address. So um, first question, uh, I'm assuming everybody can see my screen here, the how to prepare your family for a zombie apocalypse. Get a uh, yes, no, thumbs up, something like that. Yep, okay, great. Just making sure before we start going on. So uh, Steve briefly introduced, my name is uh, Corey and I am the family program coordinator for the RA uh, Canoe Camping Club. And uh, so some of you may be familiar with me, uh, but uh, today's presentation uh, primarily is going to be on families, but um, there is definitely lots of value here for uh, people without kids. Uh, also, depending on where uh, your living situation is, uh, I try to have a variety of different things we're going to talk about. So whether you live uh, you know, outside of the city core, whether you live in an apartment or a, a, a townhome, that kind of thing. Um, there's lots, uh, lots of opportunity uh, to uh, to have some fun. Uh, again, I think with uh, everything going on, we can all enjoy uh, a little bit of humor. So that's going to be one of the focuses of today's presentation um, is uh, uh, a little bit more of a lighthearted tone um, uh, to that. So what got me started uh, was last summer I was going through all my camping gear and uh, uh, I came to realize that uh, I had uh, five different uh, stoves and fuel sources, uh, ways of purifying water and that uh, just looking at everything I had accumulated uh, from my uh, backcountry camping uh, that had inadvertently become a, a prepper, uh, someone who uh, prepares for the end times or natural disasters and such. Um, so I got me thinking that, you know, this might be an interesting way to uh, help develop essential survival skills um, as part of uh, learning backcountry camping skills um, and vice versa. So instead of, you know, necessarily taking your family out, um, saying we're going to go camp in the woods uh, for a week, uh, might be we're preparing for, um, you know, whatever disaster. Uh, and uh, that got me thinking about uh, zombie apocalypses. Uh, you know, I thought it would be uh, kind of a funny thing uh, that uh, you could uh, use as your um, uh, reason to be preparing. Uh, so the first thing is that uh, um, as we've seen in the last couple of weeks, uh, we can't necessarily rely on the government in the uh, event uh, of a zombie apocalypse. Um, this uh, was meant to be a bit of a joke as well. For some of you may know, uh, during the snowstorm in Toronto there, uh, our Premier Doug Ford was out uh, rescuing some cars. In a zombie apocalypse, he probably won't be there uh, to help us. So uh, developing uh, the skills to be able to help uh, yourself, your family, and those in your community uh, can definitely be uh, uh, helpful. So you think, okay, so how do we get to zombies? And, you know, uh, you know, is we just, you know, sounds kind of funny and goofy and all that sort of stuff. But some of you might not know that uh, there actually are plans for a uh, zombie apocalypse that the US government has developed. Um, there is a document called Con Plan 8888 that's four eights. Uh, also known as the counter zombie dominance, uh, which the US Department of Defense Strategic Command uh, developed in 2011. So there was actually a very detailed document. I link at the end of the presentation if you're uh, so interested to, uh, to read about it. Uh, and even the Center for Disease Control, uh, they uh, have developed plans. And in 2018, they also uh, put together a graphic novel, uh, which was uh, um, to help teach preparedness, uh, emergency preparedness skills, uh, similar to what we're doing today um, to, uh, to have some fun. So Lynette, uh, I was going to suggest we find it and, um, okay, sorry, I, uh, that was 
sorry, wrote a briefing note on the document when I was going to emergency management. Oh, that's pretty awesome. So I uh, I don't think Canada has anything. I don't know if it's, uh, you know, we just don't have the same sense of humor, or maybe just, you know, got more important things to worry about. But uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see if we could uh, develop a uh, Canadian version uh, of that. So, um, Tonight, uh, we're going to go through a number of uh, essential things uh, for uh, uh, survival. We're going to go through uh, mental health, physical health, water, food, shelter, tools, training, and resources. So um, we're going to talk about how those can be translated into backcountry camping skills or vice versa, how some of the skills that you learn uh, through, uh, and I say backcountry camping because this could be hiking, uh, could be canoeing or what a, a kayaking, whatever means that you use uh, to get into the backcountry uh, and go camping uh, overnight uh, or for multiple days. So uh, one thing to make sure we understand uh, is I'm not going to tell I'm not going to teach you the skills. I'm not going to uh, get into what gear you should buy or um, whatnot. What uh, the purpose of this is to really kind of open people's idea minds to the different ways that um, you could potentially learn some of these skills and have some fun, especially with kids, um, to develop some of these skills that uh, would help you, uh, again, as I mentioned before, you, your family, and those in your community in case of any disaster. Uh, we're using zombie apocalypse as the um, uh, scenario for tonight, um, but it could be apply, uh, apply to anything. Uh, so if anybody has any questions or comments, please put that in the chat. Um, I'll take a break uh, throughout the presentation um, to uh, uh, give people opportunity to ask questions, uh, as well, hopefully share some stories uh, based on the topic that we're talking about. So before I proceed, uh, does anybody have any questions um, or comments that they want to make before I proceed? Nope. Okay. So the first thing we're going to talk about is mental health. So this, uh, this quote uh, is it's very popular. You may have heard it before from uh, Viktor Frankl. Everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude and in, in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's way. So if you've read uh, The Man's Search for Meaning or similar resources, uh, mental, um, mental preparedness uh, is definitely one of the biggest things that you can uh, bring to any kind of an emergency situation um, and recognizing that um, you have the power to make decisions and um, um, and uh, deal with the situation at hand. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is uh, resilience. So um, when we're talking about resilience, we're talking about psychological resilience, which is the ability to mentally or emotionally cope with a crisis or to return to pre-crisis status quickly. So um, it's kind of your ability to bounce back. Um, and uh, this uh, uh, has definitely uh, pushed many of us uh, through the pandemic, uh, tested our resilience, um, and uh, pushed many of us to or beyond our limits. Uh, I'm sure many people have had to uh, develop uh, resiliency skills, uh, whether they wanted to or not through the pandemic. Obviously, some people may have done better or worse, depending on circumstances. It's not judgment. Um, um, but developing resiliency uh, is definitely something that will help uh, in your everyday life, as well as in the time of a crisis. Um, and for me, this is one, as a parent, this is one of the uh, most important skills that uh, I can teach my sons, um, because it not only gives them the ability to adapt and find solutions to problems um, in their life, but um, also prepares them for uh, situations I may not have prepared them for. Um, so it gives them the tools to be able to uh, move past those challenges and find solutions uh, on their own. So when we're talking about backcountry camping skills, resiliency is a big one. Uh, you know, without resiliency, uh, how are you going to get all that crap uh, across the portage that you brought while you're getting eaten by mosquitoes in 30 plus degrees Celsius weather? Um, you know, some of us might, uh, some of the old timers might say it helps build character. Uh, so uh, whether uh, you call it resiliency or just building character, um, backcountry camping skills is definitely a time, uh, especially when things don't go as planned um, and you have to find alternative uh, solutions um, to, uh, to issues. 
Um, maybe you forgot something, the weather is not what you were expecting, that kind of thing. So um, one personal example at the beginning of the pandemic and such, um, one of the things uh, is uh, really kind of uh, accepted the situation and chose to um, sort of, I guess, run head on into it and start putting things together, um, you know, keeping uh, routines, uh, physical health, uh, mental health, um, prioritizing those, uh, you know, and that was a game from some of uh, resiliency um, that I had built up uh, myself as well as help with the children um, in order to um, face, uh, you know, an unprecedented situation uh, with that. Uh, I'm going to pause to give people an opportunity if they wanted to share um, their ideas of what resiliency is, ways that you can develop it uh, in yourself and in children, um, maybe a short story as far as uh, how uh, you know, you've you used that uh, um, in um, your backcountry camping skills. Feel free to unmute yourself or uh, you can post something in chat if you prefer not to uh, speak. Yes, Corey, it's still here. <clears throat> and actually, I think that that resilience thing really is 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 one of the wonders that can come with 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 camping and and especially the multi day activities, because you can never take account and plan for every eventuality. You know, uh, in terms of, you know, whether you're going to have a you're going to be windbound one day or another. Or, and this is where I find in particular taking uh, taking kids on camping trips. It gets them adjusted to um, being able to sort of roll with the punches a bit and like and, and, and thinking about, OK, well, we have two or three things we're going to plan for. You know, I, I think they're, they're that that what you're just taught that that's a real gift you can give children taking them camping. As as Natalia just said, the ability to adapt to change. Yeah, in my uh, professional life, I, I work in IT and, uh, you know, many of you know, uh, change is the new normal. Um, you know, the ability to adapt to change is becoming more and more an essential skill. I think it always has been, but uh, as the uh, pace of change and innovation uh, continues to accelerate and the uh, challenges that we face in our everyday life, uh, resiliency definitely uh, can help um, both inside and outside of work. Anyone else? So one of the ones, uh, growing up, I faced some challenges and I spent a great deal of my life worrying about it. And then I looked around and I saw there were a whole bunch of people who were much worse off than I was. And so now when something pops up and goes wrong, my first question is, well, what else could have happened? And about 80% of them are worse than what happened to me. So I sort of look at it and say, well, in that case, I'm not doing so bad. And the way I manifest it to others is by saying, for example, if uh, a waiter screws up my order, well, if that's the worst thing that happens to me this week, I'm having a pretty good week. And by being able to turn that switch on or being able to say that, it actually twisted the way I, my mental attitude works. And, and so that's where my resiliency came from. Yeah, and that was kind of part of uh, uh, Victor Frankel's book, uh, you know, is this kind of reframing things, uh, situations that you're in. And, you know, uh, it's also too acknowledging, um, you know, the struggles that each of us, um, you know, may be going through and stuff, not to uh, sometimes discount, you know, uh, you're sitting on the side of the lake with a broken boat and it's pouring rain, uh, it still sucks, uh, you know, even if it's the worst, uh, not it's not the worst thing that's happened to you. Uh, it still doesn't make it any easier to cope with. So, uh, so yeah, be be uh, be uh, good to yourself as well too is what I would say uh, as well too. So, all right. Um, so unless anybody else raises a hand, um, yep, yep, planning uh, definitely. That's uh, that's a big thing. Uh, you know, if you uh, can have a couple of plans ahead of time for uh, situations, especially when it comes to uh, some of the topics we'll talk, talk later on about having emergency uh, gear or uh, skills. Um, nobody plans to need those, but uh, you know, uh, having that available to you definitely uh, makes dealing with something a lot easier um, and having those tools in your toolkit definitely, uh, definitely helps. All right, so the lost art of boredom. 
So uh, this is a fun one for uh, for me. Um, so um, when the zombie apocalypse starts, uh, life's not going to be very boring. It's probably going to be a scary hell that we're all living through. Um, but if you do manage to survive through all of that, um, you might get to a point where you're just going to die of boredom. Uh, so uh, being able to uh, be comfortable with boredom and uh, whatnot is not only just a life skill, but uh, something that uh, can help you, um, you know, in a zombie apocalypse or, you know, when you go back country camping. So uh, one of the things is allowing time to be bored. It sounds odd, uh, you know, but uh, uh, many of us, you know, sometimes you go for a walk and those when you come up with your best ideas. Um, and sometimes, you know, you just need to, uh, to take a break and, and uh, enjoy the moment. So, you know, not uh, um, being comfortable with that feeling um, and not running to the first thing um, to help alleviate that boredom. Uh, for a lot of people, it's a very uncomfortable feeling, um, especially in today's world of nonstop stimulus that just constantly begging for our attention. Um, it's, uh, it's easy to alleviate that boredom. And especially when you uh, talk about with kids and such, um, you know, as parents, sometimes we want to alleviate that boredom for them. Um, but to me, you're really depriving them of an essential life skill um, that uh, all of us uh, really need to learn. Um, and uh, taking your kids backcountry camping, perfect opportunity to, uh, to practice boredom, um, especially if you're canoe camping and uh, maybe there's only so much that you can bring. Um, you know, that's a, that's a great opportunity to, uh, to practice your boredom. Um, a funny little story for me, uh, I think my son's on the call, you'll probably uh, get tired of hearing this, this, uh, this um, story that I tell, but, uh, you know, when my son was young, you know, maybe about three years old, uh, he'd occasionally come to me and, you know, he'd say, Dad, I'm bored. Um, and I turned to him and I'd say, uh, have you tried using your imagination? And, you know, in the most sarcastic tone that a, um, a toddler can come up with, he says, uh, he says, yes, Dad. So I said, well, you know, if you tried to use your imagination, you probably wouldn't be bored. So, you know, off he'd go, going, great, thanks, Dad, you really helped. And sure enough, within a couple of minutes, he's found something um, to amuse himself. So, um, you know, just not looking to solve those problems, um, but uh, giving, the, giving them the tools uh, to be able to overcome that. So this is one of the funny, we were uh, bunk country camping, just the uh, boys and I, and I was preparing dinner and I looked over and here they are sitting on the chairs and what you can't see in this picture is they're actually facing towards the lake and uh so i went over asking you know kind of like uh what are you guys doing and uh they told me that they're watching the nature channel which i thought was really uh really cute they uh i guess had uh, reached their boredom limit and uh had found a uh, found a solution uh, themselves um this is the stick game uh, we were on a family camping trip in Algonquin and one of the ladies that was on the trip, um, she had uh, uh, been a teacher in the far north and uh, I may be wrong, but I believe this was an Inuit game um, that uh, kids, uh, kids would play and uh, essentially you just tie a, a couple of sticks, uh, throw it over a branch and hang it and what you do is you, you know, uh, similar to um, limbo, you uh, raise the raise the bar, raise the sticks uh, every little bit until uh, the last person uh, is uh, um, standing as far as able to uh, not kick the uh, kick the sticks. So um, you know, very simple, just literally some rope and a and a stick, and uh, they played with that for probably close to an hour, um, which again just shows. Um, the resiliency of children and, uh, you know, how simple um, that fun, uh, fun can be uh, for them. So the next is uh, physical health. So this is a, uh, uh, an important uh, component in all of life in general, um, but especially if you start getting into backcountry camping, um, you know, having a basic fitness level uh, is definitely going to um, help, uh, whether that makes the journey a little bit easier and a little bit more enjoyable, maybe a little less pain free. Um, but uh, especially in a zombie apocalypse, uh, physical, uh, physical health is definitely going to uh, definitely going to be a asset uh, to you. So um, on the zombie topic of physical health, uh, some of you may have heard of some of these, uh, but uh, 
Um, there's a zombie mod run uh, uh, Canada. So that's a, um, uh, a activity uh, like a race of sort that you can join where some of the people are dressed up as zombies, as you can see in this picture, and they're trying to chase you. Uh, so, you know, that's a fun activity uh, that you or your kids, uh, you know, could get uh, could do. Um, there's also a mobile app um, called Zombies Run, uh, which is a way to learn running. Uh, and I think it has like prompts and, you know, occasionally you start hearing zombie noises. So you got to run away. It's something fun to do. Um, I can't speak to the quality or anything, but there is, I saw a zombie apocalypse Ottawa, a scavenger hunt survival game um, that uh, you could register for. So that might be something fun, a way to get out, get some exercise um, and uh, feel your zombie craving uh, that uh, you might have. So the uh, next is, uh, uh, Wilderness first aid training. So many of us may have uh, taken basic first aid training um, either through uh, our needs for work or other uh, life circumstances. Um, but uh, in an emergency situation, uh, especially uh, you know something like a zombie apocalypse, um, many of the services are going to be un uh, overwhelmed and unable to help you. Um, and even in your day-to-day -day life, um, when you're in the wilderness, uh, even if you do have cellular signal, depending on where you are, it might be hours or days away uh, for someone to come and help you. Um, so having beyond uh, basic first aid uh, when going into the wilderness is definitely going to help you. Um, uh, one of the ways that I look at this as well too is, is that, um, you know, kind of back to Lynette's about having multiple plans and such. Um, this isn't necessarily just about um, me being able to save myself or my family, but I may come across someone else in the wilderness who needs my help. Um, so being able to help that person as well um, definitely uh, can be um, um, definitely an asset. Um, so for when it comes to kids, uh, most kids are going to be too young to learn these skills. Uh, definitely, there's some things that you can teach them, some basic first aid and such. Um, so that's more of something that um, the parents, the adults, um, you know, you can learn. Um, and the more people to learn, uh, learn some of these wilderness first aid skills, um, it's uh, definitely going to make a, a, a much more um, a comfortable situation if you have to deal with uh, any kind of injuries um, that, of course, were unplanned. So the next, uh, when we talk about physical health, is uh, understanding um, shock, dehydration, hyperthermia, and hypothermia, um, understanding some of the risks, the signs, and how to treat those. Uh, so especially, um, uh, you know, understanding what signs, especially in children, uh, young kids uh, often won't tell you uh, that they're cold or that they're too hot. Um, so, you know, being able to recognize those symptoms in others um, could potentially avoid a more serious, uh, serious situation. Um, and uh, especially in a zombie apocalypse type situation, um, shock is probably going to be the biggest one you're going to have to deal with. Uh, and later on, maybe getting into uh, dehydration, hypo or hypothermia. Um, one uh, personal um, uh, anecdote or situation for me, um, we were, uh, my friend and I, we were uh, canoe camping in um, Algonquin in the Barren Canyon River area. And he had never been uh, really canoeing or camping or whatnot. So I was more of the, um, the person with the expertise and such. But again, um, understanding uh, his limitations uh, and such. So um, long story short, we managed to get ourselves sucked into a rapid uh, due to some navigation errors. And uh, um, I purposely beached the uh, canoe onto a large rock to prevent us from going further down, uh, down the rapids. Um, this immediately turned into a, an emergency situation. Um, you were talking about having uh, plans ready. Um, I, knowing that there were rapids and uh, waterfalls and whatnot in the area, I had um, uh, some extra items at the ready, uh, you know, some throw ropes, that kind of thing um, that, um, you know, on a flat water trip, I normally would not uh, carry or have readily accessible. I also had an emergency bag uh, full of the essential emergency supplies, medical and, and whatnot available. So we managed to rescue ourselves, and uh, um, he was clearly in shock. Uh, this was a pretty traumatic uh, experience for him. So again, uh, having um, some understanding of, of shock um, and recognizing some of those, 
This was also early May. Uh, the water was extremely cold. So making sure, keeping, uh, keeping an eye on uh, hypothermia uh, signs, both in myself and, uh, and him, uh, really helped us uh, get, through, uh, get through that situation. Um, and uh, again, just being able to recognize some of those signs um, in others uh, definitely can, uh, can make a big uh, difference. So um, for this, uh, when it comes to physical health, uh, I'd love to hear uh, either some uh, examples, recommendations, maybe again, short story of uh, you know, how um, this has really paid off in your backcountry camping experience. So I'll uh, open the floor to anybody who wants to share. All right, so uh, feel free to post anything in the chat. Um, raise your hand. Uh, we can definitely come back to this if something later on uh, comes to your mind. Um, uh, but we'll just uh, we'll move on. Uh, so the next is uh, is water, um, and uh, you know there's lots of opportunities uh, for learning here, especially when it uh, comes to kids. Um, you know, it's be fun activities that you can do, whether that's at home or um, in the wilderness and uh, um, learning uh, how uh, to uh, safely um, find water and, and, and uh, purify the water, make it safe to drink is, uh, especially in a zombie apocalypse, is definitely going to be uh, really, really important. Uh, the last thing you want to do is die from a zombie because you got diarrhea and had to stop at the outhouse and, and got ambushed by a zombie. So, um, you know, uh, definitely don't want to, uh, don't want to be drinking unsafe water, uh, during, uh, during a zombie apocalypse. So, um, learning about the different sources of water and the different risks associated with each source, um, how to find and collect water and how to make that water safe. Um, so for kids that maybe are more, um, into the sciences or, you know, want to do more of that, maybe not necessarily interested in the outdoorsy aspect, this is a great opportunity uh, maybe to do some science experiments uh, and projects with the kids. Uh, again, whether that's while you're camping or um, at home, so that uh, you know you can practice these and learn these. Um, some different ways you'll learn that, uh, wow, that takes a lot of time, or maybe it doesn't pay, you know, maybe that's the mo not the most efficient way to do that. Um, and then having the necessary um, tools uh, available to you um, that might be useful uh, either, like I said, when you're backcountry camping or just in, in any kind of an emergency, uh, emergency situation. Um, so I'll, again, I'll open the floor if anybody has any thoughts or suggestions, comments uh, around water, uh, water safety. Hmm. Sorry. Were you going to say something, Paul? Yeah, Corey, I think one of the things I, I like to do on a trip is to make sure that there's like a water filter in every boat. You don't, that's one of the things you don't scrimp on you. You make sure that there's lots because, you know, dehydration can come at you and hit you fairly quickly. Um, I, you know, I've, I've had that on a trip before and it's, it, it takes you a couple of days to get back, you know, after being significantly dehydrated. So, you know, having that available and, and making sure that people uh, have access to it. And if you're a trip leader watching out for, for signs that, you know, people just have not had um, enough water in the course of the day. Yeah, it's interesting, Paul. One of the things I remember reading, uh, interestingly enough, that most often people who get uh, upset stomachs and stuff uh, while well, backcountry is often due to uh, poor hand hygiene. Um, that uh, interestingly enough, uh, you know, you can have lots of clean drinking water, but uh, if you're not practicing uh, basic hand uh, or hygiene, uh, often that's the source where people get uh, get sick and stuff. So, uh, uh, but yeah, I know definitely, uh, I know myself, I do carry uh, multiple ways. I even have like a small kit of uh, chemicals as a last resort um, as well to, uh, for that. Mark, are you gonna share something? Yeah, so I, I take along, a couple of great big water scans, like uh, one six liters and one's eight liters. And when we head out into the water, and on cold weather too, because people don't realize 
dehydration is a big contribution to hypothermia as well. And I found that people don't want to take the time to filter water, but you could, if you've got this great big eight liter thing of water sitting in front of you, they don't mind refilling their jug. So they're more likely to um, keep filled up. The other thing about having two, two big bags is coming to your point about hand hygiene. You know, one of them I fill up and that's just used for you know, cooking or whatever around the campsite. The other one, I hang it by a tree on a trail to the uh, outhouse, put a bottle of soap on it and a spigot. And so people on the way uh, back from the outhouse, it's very easy to wash your hands under running water. Yep, exactly. Anyone else, um, either through chat or uh, unmute yourself? Um, Actually, yes, so usually, Corey, the, the one thing I do when I take trips out, <clears throat> it, it's pretty standard, especially during the day, like <clears throat> at each break, it's just there's a standard thing, so the things you go through, how's everybody feeling, you know, I, does anybody like, you know, and then see how people respond to you and always reminding people to drink water and set targets for them by and large. Like, you know, by the end of the day, you need to have drank at least a liter of water. So this is what we need to do. <clears throat> just to make sure everybody stays happy and healthy and has a good time. So it's, it's a little bit like a constant reminder, as Paul was saying. Yeah, as a parent, uh, there's many of those things you just feel like you're nagging your kids constantly. Uh, you know, have you had some water? Okay, have some more. Um, especially when you're out on the water and such on a warm day, um, it uh, you don't realize. That's actually one of the interesting things as well. A lot of people don't realize how uh, how much water you consume on a daily basis. Um, even in backcountry uh, camping and such, uh, you'd be quite surprised how much water um, you use between uh, cooking and cleaning and drinking. Um, it's uh, water is a, a vital uh, vital element to our uh, our survival. Um, so uh, so yeah. Anyone else? Okay, John. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you, John. Yeah, okay. In terms of emergency preparedness, um, I keep at least 60 liters of water on all kinds of homes. You know, except for a zombie eclipse of us. So we're pretty much that work. Yeah, I keep a supply of food, I keep a supply of water at home, at least 60 liters. Um, also, I, I joined the club in the day when we didn't filter water. Um, in the 70s, we just went out to the middle of the lake and we drank water. And it, it hardly affected me at all. Um, you know, if I was stranded on an island, uh, windbound for a couple of days, and for whatever reason, I didn't have any filtering water, well, I would mean, boil it, uh, perhaps. But, um, you know what? I mean, if you couldn't do any of that, I, I would drink the water because it's more important than the risk, depending on where you are. But, you know, um, to be able to get water away from the shore, I, I definitely drink it after the day rather than die of black water. Yeah, and that definitely, uh, especially um, if you can have some awareness of. Um, the water sources in where you are, uh, you know, where there may be some uh, pollutants upstream um, that, uh, you know, if you're aware of that might influence decisions uh, and, and such, uh, um, you know, uh, one of the challenges, unfortunately, like is if you end up with some sort of an illness, uh, it might require even more water than you needed before. And, you know, that's uh, um, definitely been situations where, uh, you know, people have, and you know, died of dehyd died of dehydration simply because of the illness. Even if they are drinking water, if it's not safe water. So especially if somebody is sick, the need to boil that water or make the water safe just becomes that much more uh, important as well too. Um, and it's important for everybody to assess their own risks as well. You know, um, you know, John might be comfortable uh, with it, and if someone else isn't, that's their their choice as well too, right? But uh, times have definitely changed, especially with uh, human uh 
human involvement uh, and such, um, you know, uh, the waters are not uh, not as don't run as free and aren't uh, as clean as they uh, they were uh, many generations ago. All right, so uh, let's move on to the uh, next topic, uh, which is food. So I'm not sure if anybody has heard of the story of Christopher McCandless. Uh, there was a, a book and a movie uh, that was uh, that's called uh, Into the Wild. Um, it's a uh, it's an interesting story, and also uh, especially in this topic, a bit of a cautionary tale where um, he, uh, you know, as they would say, had uh, enough knowledge to be dangerous where he had books and uh, he had information, um, but unfortunately he made, uh, made, um, made a mistake and he'd eaten something that he thought was something else um, and eventually led, uh, led to him uh, dying of starvation. Uh, so uh, especially in a zombie apocalypse, um, you know, you might be able to have a little bit of information, but having that knowledge and practicing those skills ahead of time um, is definitely going to be uh, a lot better than trying it out for the first time uh, in a um, in an emerg emergency situation. So, excuse me. So, uh, when it comes to food, uh, there's definitely lots of learning opportunities, uh, especially with kids. Um, so different sources of food in nature. Uh, so this can be from edible plants. Uh, insects, any small animals, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, if you're into hunting or uh, trapping, any of that kind of stuff, um, that's a um, uh, an opportunity to uh, for learning. Uh, identifying different plants, um, especially uh, which ones grow in your area, knowing which ones are poisonous, safe to eat, uh, which ones could maybe be used for medicinal purposes. Um, sometimes um, uh, there. Uh, uh, a plant or a food uh, may be um, uh, poisonous or not healthy in a certain form, but once transformed into a different form, then it becomes healthy. Um, if I remember correctly, and somebody can obviously correct me if I'm wrong on this, but um, my understanding is acorns in their, like if you just take it out of the tree, crack it open, um, I don't know if it'll kill you, but it's definitely not healthy for you. Um, but I think if they're boiled for long enough, um, then there's some chemical transformation that happens um, and then they become edible. Now, not necessarily nutritious or uh, something you'd want, but again, it's, a, it's an uh, example of how taking something from one form and transforming it through some sort of chemical process may, uh, may make it safe to eat and understanding those, because that could be the opposite. It may be uh, safe to eat in one form, but once, you know, say heated, uh, becomes uh, unhealthy to eat. So um, being able to identify uh, those plants. Um, I'm not sure, uh, you know, again, there might be people on the call that uh, uh, know that there's lots of wild um, plants, edible plants, even in Ottawa, um, especially um, people from, uh, I'd say different cultures, but, you know, not, not just that, but um, different, um, different cultures have uh, different uh, things that they use, uh, spices or herbs or, you know, just edible items. And it's amazing uh, the number of times I've been walking down uh, NCC Pass or different forested. And, uh, you know, there's people with uh, bags just collecting um, all of these, uh, these, uh, these food items uh, uh, that uh, they're able to uh, take advantage of. So um, even as I said, just something interesting that to, uh, to do with, uh, do with your kids and, and uh, be able to identify um, uh, different food sources um, with that. Another one um, is uh, food preservation. So this can be canning, smoking, dehydrating, um, uh, different ways uh, to preserve food, um, especially in a, in a zombie apocalypse situation, uh, your fridge probably and your freezer probably aren't gonna be working. Uh, so, you know, having the ability to preserve some of the uh, supplies that you've gathered uh, for longer durations or preventing from being spoiled. Um, and again, this is a transferable skill uh, for backcountry camping. Learning some of these uh, skills will enable you to maybe uh, bring a wider variety of food with you on longer trips um, that you maybe hadn't uh, thought was possible. Uh, this is another example from uh, the Christopher McCandless situation. Um, 
he had, uh, I believe it was a moose or a deer, one of the two, he had killed that animal in hopes of uh, eating it. But obviously there was way too much for a single person and the meat would spoil faster uh, than he would be able to consume it. So one of the things he had tried to do was smoke, smoke the meat, um, but uh, he had not done it correctly and, and essentially spoiled the meat. And uh, in his journals and such, that was one of his, um, his big regrets uh, that, you know, he had taken the life of this animal and essentially had wasted it. Um, so again, pr practicing some of these things uh, ahead of time uh, will, like any other skill, help you develop those skills um, and that, uh, you know, you'll be more familiar at using um, if you ever uh, needed those. Kids can have lots of fun uh, learning different ways to cook as well too. Uh, we, um, you can use uh, cardboard box ovens, there's stone ovens, Dutch ovens. There's many different ways um, that you, uh, you can learn to, uh, to cook um, that you might not be uh, aware or even possible. Uh, last week's presentation was about all the different uh, uh, food and all the delicious things that you can bring, um, you know, and especially in a zombie apocalypse uh, scenario, uh, having some delicious uh, dessert that's been prepared in a Dutch oven uh, definitely could help uh, lift, uh, lift some spirits. Uh, again, with kids, uh, you could do a scavenger hunt uh, to try and find, uh, maybe if you don't even eat them, but to identify the different edible plants or uh, sources of food, uh, maybe while you're on a nature walk or while you're out uh, backcountry camping, uh, could be something exciting uh, to do. Um, I'm going to pause here again uh, to see if anybody has anything that they would like to, uh, to share. Okay, uh, again, same as usual, if, uh, if something comes up, uh, let me know. Okay, so the next is we're going to get into shelter. Uh, so um, this is definitely something that kids can have fun uh, with, and uh, you know may have already been uh, may have already done at home. Anybody that's kind of made a fort in their bedroom or in their living room, uh, you know, is definitely uh, learning opportunities uh, for the different types of uh, shelters that you can pr uh, you can produce you can make. So uh, lots of learning opportunities to uh, try the different ways that you can make a uh, shelter. Uh, what are some of the pros and some of the cons of each type of shelter um, and uh, different ways to protect yourself against the elements based on season. Um, obviously building a uh, shelter in the middle of the summer is a lot different uh, situation uh, than building a shelter in the middle of the winter. Um, or, you know, the difference between a very hot, sunny shelter versus a, um, you know, try and protect yourself against strong winds, uh, that kind of thing. Um, on uh, several trips, uh, you know, this is something that I've uh, practiced before. Um, I was on uh, one um, trip, it was just with adults and such. And uh, we had this beautiful beach site, but um, there was a really strong wind coming in, so strong that you, you essentially couldn't even talk to the person standing beside you, it was so strong. So obviously trying to cook on stoves and that kind of thing was gonna be, um, gonna be a challenge. So I had gathered, uh, I had some, um, some spare rope with me and uh, I had gathered uh, some supplies and I built a, a fairly large wind shelter. It was probably about 15 feet wide in total. Um, and then uh, it was probably about maybe about four feet high. So that allowed people to sit behind it and uh, be able to have a talk, uh, do some cooking, prep foods, that kind of stuff. So, uh, so that was really uh, was something interesting um, to practice those skills um, and then also get a, a benefit of that. I'll, uh, does anybody else have any other thoughts, suggestions uh, that they might want to uh, share? All right. Uh, so on to our next is uh, tools. So one of the things that really separates uh, humans from the rest of the animal kingdom is our ability to make tools. Um, you know, there are some uh, animals that have been proven to be able to make and use tools, but uh, by far humans have definitely, uh, you know, um, really kind of expanded this uh, to, its, uh, to its full potentials. Um, and there's a number of learning opportunities uh, for ourselves and, and for the kids that, uh, you know, we can have a lot of fun learning um, the different tools and the different ways that we can use those tools. Um, and especially in a zombie apocalypse, again, you might be able to scavenge for all kinds of things, but 
um, maybe you're not going to want to carry all that stuff with you. So maybe there are some things that you could build as you need them. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, having those skills and practicing those skills ahead of time uh, can also be a fun uh, learning opportunity. So uh, first thing is navigation. So learning how to use a map and compass, uh, how to navigate by the sun, moon and stars, uh, how to use things like sundials. Uh, you can get into even doing some things like geocaching, right? You know, being able to understand the, the train and navigate, uh, navigate through that can be a lot of fun. When it comes to communication, uh, learning some of the universal signals, uh, both for distress and uh, you know navigation, that kind of thing, um, and other and ways to uh, to communicate uh, in the wilderness, um, especially uh, cross distances and such. Um, those can be kind of interesting uh, interesting things that you can have fun with. Uh, knives and other weapons. Uh, so. Um, these can be used to make other tools, uh, can be used for hunting and trapping, um, and uh, most definitely could be used to kill zombies. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so that could be uh, some, uh, some interesting skills to be able to develop um, some of the different uh, tools that might uh, be useful. Um, building tools, uh, so these could be things like hammers and saws, um, you know, how you might be able to craft these or, um, uh, you know, different types, uh, you know, some people may have uh, seen before, it's almost like a, I don't know what you call it, but basically it's a wire with two hooks on it. And, uh, you know, if you, you saw it back and forth, it will saw through small, uh, small uh, wood and such, um, you know, wouldn't you, what you would normally think of as a saw, but, um, you know, that, is much more compact uh, and easier to transport. So um, just trying and experimenting uh, with some of those things could be fun. Uh, so uh, also uh, tools that can be used for cooking. Um, I remember quite a few years ago, um, uh, we had uh, traveled to uh, um, canoed across the lake to a, a beach that had some um, uh, charcoal fire pits and uh, we brought everything. Um, and uh, uh, I got there and realized I forgot basically all the kitchen utensils and everything to be able to cook. So um, because I had a little bit of skills uh, and, uh, and doing things, I went and got some sticks and uh, I uh, quickly whittled those into some chopsticks. Uh, and uh, we were able to use those uh, temporarily uh, as a fix. Um, and I also remember a story by uh, one of my friends, uh, her dad had, uh, uh, he's been traveling into the back country for many, many years. Uh, I think uh, at that, the point that he had told the story, he was probably in his seventies. Um, and uh, he drove three hours and paddled quite a ways into Algonquin and realized he forgot all his pots and pans at home. Uh, so this could have been an opportunity for him to go and you know, go home, maybe cancel his trip, whatnot. Uh, but he had skills uh, to be able to make things. And uh, he made himself a set of pots out of birch bark that he used throughout the week. And, um, you know, when maybe they became a little bit worn out or whatnot, he just made some new ones. Um, so I thought that was really kind of interesting, uh, you know, um, different skills that maybe hadn't thought of uh, in those benefits that uh, you could get. Uh, ropes and knots. Uh, Again, in a zombie apocalypse, uh, knowing how to use ropes and knots uh, definitely going to be a essential skill. Um, it's also something fun that uh, you can uh, do while you're camping uh, and practice, uh, especially while you're camping uh, and stuff uh, can be a, uh, a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, transportation. Uh, so, you know, how to uh, build basically uh, like a basic raft, uh, you know, to be able to get across the water, um, you know, or even something as elaborate more as like a canoe or a larger, a larger vessel. Um, you know, this might, uh, might be something that uh, in a zombie apocalypse you have to do. Uh, maybe you see this beautiful island oasis, uh, you know, and you have to get to it uh, safely. So, uh, you know, being able to build your own boat to get there um, might be, uh, might be of value. I um, get to stop Again, just give people an opportunity if they have inter uh, something they'd like to share, um, or uh, feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, Mark posted here on a trip to Labrandre. We discovered on the first evening that we all had that all we had was one pot to cook pancakes. The next morning, we threw a big flat rock in the campfire and used it as a skillet. Um, yeah. So again, that's uh, it's really interesting. Uh, and again, that. Uh, I'm sure that probably a uh, lesson uh, has been learned through experience there, Mark, about uh, making sure you got a dry walk, dry rock as wet ones will explode. Um, you know, again, that probably is either something somebody has learned through experience and shared with you or you discovered yourself. So.
Anything anyone else wants to share? Any questions uh, either on this slide or previous slides before I continue? Uh, Corey, I, I had a question. Yep. Um, it was about knots. So uh, my so so there's there's many different knots um, around. I mean, there's dozens and dozens of knots for different outdoor uses. And um, from what I've read, you know, a lot of them kind of spring up for for very particular uses. You know, if you're you know sailing or or whatever it is. I'm just wondering in your experience if there's like you know I guess with knots especially it's kind of if you don't a lot of them can be pretty complex and you know you don't use it if you don't use it regularly you're going to you're going to lose it and I'm just wondering for you if there's maybe just a handful of knots that you personally have used often that you would just kind of recommend if you memorized um were there any just kind of a couple knots that you find very helpful on your trips yeah, like you said, um, you, a lot of them are generally uh, can be specific to a certain purpose. Um, and uh, with backcountry camping skills, um, there are certain knots that you might become familiar with um, for a specific purpose. Um, to be honest with you, a lot of the knots that I know, I don't know them by name. Um, I just know them by, I do it this way. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, it's funny, I'll tie a knot I'm hanging something or whatever. And my son will go, dad, what knot is that? And I go, the knot of the day, because uh, that's the knot I tied today. And, and I probably, like I said, couldn't repeat it um, and whatnot. So um, my uh, there's definitely tons of resources out there as far as like some simple and basic knots. Uh, the biggest thing is understanding um, the purpose of certain knots. So for example, there are certain uh, slip knots that you can do uh, for hanging things like tarps and stuff like that, um, where it allows you to adjust the tension. Um, a, um, one of the knots that um, um, Dot Bonifet actually uh, with the canoe club had taught me uh, was the uh, trucker's hitch. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, it was not a knot that I used very often, if at all. Um, but uh, last uh, summer, there was a family that had pulled into a uh, gas station and they had a, a large mattress on their roof that uh, was not secured well at all. So I was able to teach them that trucker's hitch uh, specifically for securing that onto the roof of their vehicle. Um, so I would find specific use cases that you have, uh, whether it's um, you know tying uh, lines to your canoe or hanging tarps or um, you know uh, bundling up. Uh, you know, say you've got a mattress or compression sack, you need to kind of hold it together. Because um, again, yeah, a lot of the knots are very uh, unique, and some of the knots also can be dangerous in certain situations. Um, somebody on the chat might be able to remind me of the knot, but I know that there is one knot that in the whitewater world um, is uh, frowned upon. I can't remember if it's the bowline, um, but in uh, certain circumstances that knot can come undone. Um, so um, it's a knot that, uh, for example, a lot of people uh, would avoid. Um, I see Lynette is uh, unmuted. Maybe you know Lynette. Um, I've I've seen a bowline, uh, otherwise known as a bowlin. Okay. Not come undone in a bad situation and cause a life-threatening situation. So I never use it. So I tend to use the uh, figure eight knots. There's, there's a whole family of figure eight knots that are used for different situations. Uh, and you mentioned the trucker's hitch and there's um, several other knots. I put together a knot board with um, physical samples of the knots um, up on a black board in the club boathouse. So if you can find that, it's a big, item it must be four feet but it's fold you can fold it down mm -hmm. so it might be hidden somewhere but it's on a black coroplast board with all of the knots that we commonly use within the club for canoe situations it's there uh, Lynette <clears throat> great uh, yeah I've, I've seen it a number of times yeah, thank you for that as well, Lynette. Yeah, anybody who's been to the uh, the boathouse at the RA Center, that's you know probably one of the aside from the canoes, that's probably one of the first things you'll see. And uh, especially for kids, it's it's awesome to be able to go and see. If I remember correctly, there was even some ropes there and things like that that people could uh, practice with. So, thank you. And uh, you were going to say something, Paul? Yeah. Well, 
Oh, I was just uh, going to say, refer to the exactly the same thing that Lynette uh, said. I believe it's in the same row where the uh, flat water canoes are located. So if you head down that row in the boathouse, it's down in, at the end of that area. And can I just build on one thing Paul, Paul mentioned is, while we haven't figured out necessarily what our schedule is for like training and, 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 and spring activities in terms of tr uh, training activities, uh, well, sometimes we do offer a not tying course and, and there's a number of them you can also find on the web. I know that we're uh, like, as, as Corey mentioned, like figuring out how to, like one of the, the really beautiful things that can make a campsite really feel like home is how to figuring out how to like tie a, a tight tarp that will give, will protect you from a strong wind or rain. There's a variety of different ways to do it. Um, and, but learning one and learning it well and knowing how to do it comes in really, really handy, so. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Lynette. There's a fantastic website called Animated Knots. Um, I'll try and find it and I'll put it in the chat, uh, but you need to know the name of the knot to, to make a good use of that resource. So uh, going to the board, Finding finding out uh, the name of the knot that you want. For example, bow line. Uh, you could look that up in animated knots, and it will. It, it's got a um, an anim literally animated tying sequence. So you can stand there in front of your computer with a knot with rope in your hands and go through step by step on on how to tie each different kind of knot. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, I haven't looked myself, but I'm sure there may be even apps you can get on your phone uh, that either have like all of it or animations of it. Um, in my um, my canoe bag, my emergency bag of sort, I actually have a, a trifold thing of all like kind of different knots and stuff like that. It's uh, kind of like a laminated uh, pamphlet and stuff like that that I always use kind of potentially as a, you know, okay, the kids are bored. Here's some rope. Uh, here's you know, try and practice tying these knots or, or uh, whatnot. Um, interestingly enough, this, uh, this winter for a uh, craft project I was making, I actually learned how to do a, a diamond knot. Um, so um, it, uh, it's one of those that doesn't really have a lot of purpose other than it looks really beautiful when it's done. Um, so, you know, you can also have some fun times uh, uh, tying knots, like I said, that may not necessarily be super useful or functional, um, but, uh, but yeah. Actually, Corey, that resource you were just talking about, that, that, that little waterproof, like foldable, you fold it out, uh, you can use to be able to, uh, a couple of years ago, you get it for a few dollars, like two or three bucks. You can stick it in your first aid kit. You can get it usually from Trailhead, a few bucks, and you can pick one up. And it's just per a perfect thing to slide into a first aid kit. Definitely. Mark, were you going to share something? Yeah, the, the knot that I use more than any other, the bowl. Sorry. No, we all have our, I, I think uh, many of the outdoors folk, we all have our favorite knot. Uh, you know, I'm sure many, uh, many people will tell you, uh, uh, yeah, that they have a favorite knot. Um, so yeah, anything else uh, before I continue? What type of rope should you carry? Um, that again, comes down to the uses. Um, Different ropes uh, are going to have pros and cons to each of them in the sense that um, uh, some ropes, um, depending on um, their nature, will uh, float. Uh, some of them won't float. Uh, so again, that might be a, uh, uh, um, something to be of importance. Um, some ropes will uh, deteriorate over time based on the elements or getting wet. Um, some ropes will have... Um, no given them so when you you pull them tight they they don't extend anymore whereas other ropes will give a little bit so it partially depends on the use case um, for what you're using um, uh, some ropes as well um, depending on the knots that you're doing you may need to have say two different ropes of two different diameters uh, for it to maybe um, to be able to work uh, properly um, so 
Um, again, it depends, I'd say, really on what exactly. If you're able to share, like if there's a specific use case, like, you know, hanging tarps or uh, tying uh, boats, uh, whatnot, um, that might uh, spur some suggestions. Um, and if anybody else uh, uh, has a suggestion, uh, feel free to uh, share it as well. I unfortunately don't know the name. I have like a whole collection of different types of ropes. Um, um, some that, like I said, are better for um, certain situations and stuff. Um, and uh, some are just cheap, you know, like your nylon rope, uh, you know, definitely not the best, but like I said, sometimes it's cheap and I don't mind cutting that up into different pieces for, you know, if I'm tying, uh, lashing up something uh, temporarily or whatnot. Uh, were you gonna share something, Mark? Yeah, I was going to say the same as you. When I go on a trip, I have a variety of different ropes. Um, you know, obviously I've got something that I can actually grab and hold on to in my throw bag. So I try and avoid a quarter inch because if you need it as a throw bag, it's useless. You can't hold it. Um, I've got sort of a thick parachute cord type thing. That's great for, for putting up a tarp or hanging a food bag or something. I've got like what you said, that cheap nylon Canadian stuff which is great because I can tie it up and you know if I end up trashing it, I don't care. And I carry along a little bit of shock cord. So the shock cord on my tent pole uh, breaks, I can do something about it. Yeah, I haven't been there in a few years and somebody might be able to tell me uh, whether it's still, but uh, Trailhead Paddle Shack used to have um, a bunch of different ropes uh, that you could buy based on the foot. And most of those were um, going to be um, your most common uh, types uh, for different outdoors uh, activities, whether it's uh, water sports or uh, backcountry. So um, I do know that they, um, in the past, like I said, they, they had a, a good selection. And again, you could buy ba uh, based on the foot. Um, I would again maybe uh, you know head to the internet uh, or other forums to uh, to try and find recommendations based on the need because um, as I said like um, some ropes will float some won't um, some like I said will uh, mildew or or whatnot uh, with uh, with that so um, same thing as the diameter so how big the rope is um, how the rope is made uh, you know as far as the um, how the fibers are twined together, but even also the length, um, you know, a uh, hundred feet of rope when you're trying to hang up a tarp uh, is not necessarily going to be the most useful. Um, uh, uh, and again, you might have different ropes like um, at uh, camp, I sometimes I'll um, run lines between trees to be able to hang uh, stuff to dry and things like that. Um, so, uh, you know, that, like I said, is a different purpose than say, trying to secure my canoe, um, on a dock and such. So does anybody else have anything they'd like to share, contribute? No. Okay. So, um, one of the other important things is training. Uh, we already talked about, uh, learning some of the, uh, uh wilderness first aid, uh, skills, uh, and whatnot. Um, just general camping skills and again these are going to apply whether you're going back um you're going uh backpacking canoe kayak camping that kind of thing so um i think it was uh, mentioned earlier uh in the uh, introduction but uh the canoe club uh definitely has a number of training programs uh around certain skills uh one of the ones is a tripper training program which uh covers um a wide variety of skills. It's, um, you know, everything from cooking and packing and gear. And um, I believe at the end of it, there's also a, a trip uh, that you go on where you can um, put some of those skills uh, to use. Uh, Paddle Canada also has a national uh, camping program. Um, again, I can't speak to that. Uh, somebody else might be able to chime in one way or another. Um, and these are just a couple of examples. Um, there are definitely tons of other um, uh, organizations that will teach uh, certain uh, survival skills uh, that, uh, um, you know, if you have something specific that you're looking to learn um, might be uh, tailored to that. Um, so for first aid training, basic first aid training, you can get there's uh, in Ottawa, there's St. John's Ambulance and Red Cross. Um, I also noticed that the Red Cross has a psychological first aid training, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, they also offer swimming and water safety uh, um, 
training as well too um, that uh, may be uh, may be useful. Uh, wilderness first aid training. So uh, Red Cross and St. John's Ambulance both have uh, wilderness first aid training. Um, there's also Canadian Wilderness Medical Training. Um, I personally have taken their uh, courses and uh, um, I really enjoyed them and I, I got a lot of value out of it. I can't speak um, for others, um, but uh, there definitely are options available for developing those wilderness first aid skills above your um, basic first aid skills. So a couple of other resources that uh, you might find uh, helpful. Um, first is social media. Um, so uh, whether you hate it, you love it, whatever, um, again, they can be uh, useful tools, especially in emergency situations. Um, I know personally, for example, uh, the developing situation downtown, um, I've often been able to find information on that um, when I was initially developing way before the city or the mainstream media um, uh, even were uh, presenting that information. Uh, interestingly enough, um, I um, can't remember the disaster preparedness uh, organization in the US, um, but in cases of um, major natural disasters, you know, hurricanes or tornadoes, uh, you know, these, uh, these kind of situations, um, they're actually uh, starting to um, use um, social media as uh, sources for uh, being able to provide um, aid uh, to different people, where people were able to identify where they were, what they needed, how many people were there, that kind of information, which enabled those uh, providing rescue services to uh, target uh, potentially certain areas, um, things that they would not have known had people not been able to share. Uh, obviously, that's dependent on having um, some sort of a, uh, uh, a network connection, whether it's cellular or internet. Um, but um, um, that's one uh, resource uh, that uh, I would uh, I would recommend, um, especially in a disaster situation. Um, that's something you uh, would have to do like preemptively. So, for example, uh, with Twitter, following certain uh, government accounts or certain other organizational accounts um, uh, ahead of time, um, you know, that uh, that might be a source of, um, of information that could be helpful. Um, you know, where are the zombies uh, and, uh, you know, uh, maybe people are sharing some tips and tricks on how to uh, how to best uh, kill the zombies or evade them. Uh, that might be a useful source. Um, there's lots of mobile apps. Uh, one of the things, especially for a disaster type situation, um, is make sure that they work offline. Uh, so there may be lots of apps that require uh, an internet connection, which, uh, you know, if you're in the middle of nowhere trying to figure out, um, you know, how to uh, treat a certain injury and uh, you don't have cellular signal, that's not really going to be very useful. So um, I do know that there are a number of apps that you can download when it comes to first aid, um, that kind of thing that work offline. So um, you can easily just turn your phone into airplane mode and see if it still works. Uh, you may have to, as I said, when you first install it, maybe you'll have to um, you know, load some information into the phone first, um, but then once it's up, um, you'd be able to use that, like I said, even if you don't have a, uh, a connection. Um, the Government of Canada has a emergency preparedness guide. Uh, Ontario has uh, emergency preparedness guides as well as the city of Ottawa. So those are definitely great uh, resources as well, uh, uh, appropriate to the disasters that we may see in our region. Um, obviously the situations that uh, someone living in Florida are gonna be a lot different than someone uh, who's living in Nunavut. Um, so um, understanding the uh, things that you need to do uh, for your area and the type of uh, emergencies you're gonna need to be prepared for. Uh, Red Cross also has a um, uh, number of uh, resources as well on uh, their site. Um, when it comes to zombies, again, uh, I'm sure, you know, uh, Steve's probably just been uh, chipping at the bit here. Uh, how can I get some more zombie stuff? So uh, here's some links to uh, the Preparedness 101. So that's the CDC graphic novel uh, that they had put out in 2018, uh, full of lots of zombie stuff. Uh, you know, it might be something, as I said, give you some ideas to uh, have some fun with your kids. Um, uh, the Department of Defense's, uh, you know, con plan. Uh, there's also, I mentioned the zombie mud run, uh, the zombie mobile app, and then the uh, scavenger hunt game. Uh, links are in here. Um, I'm going to uh, share in the chat the link to the presentation.
presentation uh, that you don't need to sign up or log in or anything like that. That has um, the full presentation I've given, uh, including all of the links uh, that um, you may want. Uh, so just uh, copy that link if you're interested. Uh, once the Zoom session closes, you'll lose it. Uh, so we'll go there. So uh, thank you for making the time uh, to listen and uh, for sharing. Um, I'll uh, leave it open uh, to the end here. If anybody has any questions, comments, suggestions, anything they'd like to discuss. Um, otherwise, I'll let uh, Steve and Mark close this out. Lynette had uh, mentioned about the uh, boating requirements. Uh, yes, exactly. So for boating, yes, you have to have a, uh, a floating rope uh, specifically for, uh, for a watercraft, yep. So just before everybody runs away, um, Corey, would you mind stop, slow, uh, stop staring for a moment? Okay. So I'll put up the schedule. No, I won't. My uh, browser won't let me show the document that I just did. Sorry. Um, just let me do a, a quick hack here. Um, so upcoming seminars. Uh, on February 16th, uh, Canadian Across Canada, a couple from Kingston uh, started out in Ottawa, paddled to the Atlantic, and decided that they weren't tired yet. So then they went to British Columbia and paddled back to Ottawa and down to Kingston. And they did this as a fundraiser for uh, a local food organization. Wednesday, February 23rd. Again, all the seminars are at seven o'clock. Adaptive paddling. You would be amazed at the people who can paddle. Uh, Don and Pauline who are putting this together. Their criteria for getting somebody in a boat is, and boat being a stand-up paddleboard, canoe, or kayak, is if they fall in the water with a PFD, they can float face up. If they can do that, these two women can get the most paddling. Uh, March 2nd, on Wednesday again, uh, aeronautical search and rescue. So these are the people who fly the helicopters um, out of Trenton. So they're going to be talking about it from the point of view we haven't heard before. And part of that will be, so if they're coming to look for you in a helicopter, how do you get found? Uh, March 9th, uh, weather 101, it's club hurt, God. Uh, meteorologist, and he's done briefings to different organizations on how to read the weather. So this is going to be uh, not weather more, but if you're off someplace with no cell phone or radio, how do you look around you, stick your finger up and see what the weather's going to be? And then in closing, March 16th, uh, Dr. Glenn Kenny, I believe it is, from the, the University of Ottawa, runs a lab that does heat testing on people that's used for studies around the world. Um, their studies got the, Cal the California electricity utensils to alter the work schedules for people because they clearly demonstrated uh, how much danger it was. So he's going to be doing something about uh, being hot and cold in, in physical environments. By the way, um, if you're looking to be a lab rat, you're also looking for volunteers. Um, over to other people now. Steve, have you anything? I have nothing on my end uh, other than uh, looking forward to uh, next week's presentation. Uh, the Canary Across Canada, the, the couple that will be, will kind of be interviewing, chatting with, uh, sort of a free form dialogue. Um, they also, I, I found, have uh, published a book about their adventure, uh, which you can find on Amazon as well. Um, I'm about a third of the way through it, uh, and it's uh, it's it's quite the tale. Uh, like uh, you want to, we were talking a few a few weeks ago about what's the longest portage you ever done, you ever did. And I think uh, Scott Campbell said something like 5.1 kilometers. He sent me an, uh, an email about how about portaging over the Rocky Mountain Divide. Like, I, I think that goes right up there. So it'll be really interesting and, and looking forward to that as well. So uh, building on Mark's comments, does anybody have anything else they would like to, to offer up today? 
Well, then on that note, uh, Corey, is, were you going to offer something? Yeah, no, I was just going to say I put in uh, information for the family program, um, as well as my email address, if anybody has any questions uh, or anything they'd like to share. Excellent. So first, uh, I before closing, I'd like to offer up two comments. First of all, Corey, uh, thank you very much. Um, I got more than a few chuckles. I appreciated the innovation and the creativity that came from linking a document, as I said at the outset. I literally actually wrote a brief, you know, back on, on uh, back in 2010 um, <clears throat> and, and linking it to what we do. Uh, so well done and kudos on that. Um, and, and number two, the other thing, I, uh, there was a number of people who had questions like the not conversation seemed fairly robust and there were a few other questions about things related to, to preparation, possibly even training like. So I, I would direct you to keep an eye on our website, raccc.ca, uh, where additional information will be posted in the coming weeks and months about our, our spring training program and st uh, spring seminar sort of training program. Uh, for those of you who have interest in things uh, such as knots or, 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 or anything else in terms of flat water or wet water. Um, and on that note, uh, unless uh, Mark or any other member of the, our community who joined us today has anything else to say, uh, to offer up? Uh, just to reiterate what I just threw in the chat, uh, this is an ongoing thing. Um, any suggestions people have on, on uh, ways to improve it, I, I really like to hear it. Uh, but just as important, if anybody has suggestions for seminars for next year, um, I do keep track of all of that stuff. and. Most of these seminars that you're seeing uh, weren't my idea. I stole it from somebody else. So you could be the person that I steal an idea from for next year. Most definitely. And thank you for that, for Mark. Um, and, the, and we're high on creativity, such as Corey offered up today. So if there are no other, uh, uh, no other comments, questions, 